Good morning. Welcome to the aquaculture edition of Third Thursday Thing. Um, in this uh, workshop series, we will be looking at a couple different ways to make aquaculture ventures more profitable and uh, looking at how to implement maybe some of your current uh, technology or your current facilities um, and expand that into aquaculture. So we have a few presentations this morning and then we will be doing a tour of the floating raceway down at the, uh, the pond here on the farm. So please stick around and join us for that. Um, we'll break from 12 to 1 for lunch and then we'll do the tour of the floating raceways following that. So I uh, just wanted to extend a welcome also to all the people we have uh, joining us online and to those here in person. And uh, our first presentation coming er, it will be from Leo Fleckenstein, will be cost-saving measures for brackish water aquaculture farms. Oh, and um, if you have any questions, participants in the room, if you could please wait for the microphone so our folks joining online can hear you as well. Thank you, Janelle. So again, my name is Leo Fleckenstein. I'm a research and extension associate here at KSU, and mainly I focus on brackish water production of saltwater shrimp. So we want to talk about a couple of our research projects we've done in the last several years, uh, looking at some cost-saving measures for people producing uh, brackish water shrimp and any brackish water producer. How do I switch slides? Ah. So. We're obviously away from the coast. We don't have any saltwater sources here, and most of our producers are using indoor aquaculture. So with indoor aquaculture, we're gonna use a couple main technologies, mostly centered around recirculating aquaculture systems. So these are systems, and essentially they're defined as using very low amounts of water, so low discharge per day. Uh, we have to filter out solids and nitrogenous waste products. Uh, we have high biosecurity. We're usually located indoors. These systems are closed, so there's not a lot of water coming in or out of them. Uh, we have a lot of other advantages like heat retention, um, things like that. And we have a variety of different techniques and styles of systems. So clear water RAS, which kind of is what it sounds. We have very clear water, high amounts of solids filtration. Uh, Bioflock systems that are the exact opposite. We have very low amounts of solids filtration and hybrids of the two. So some of the drawbacks to indoor aquaculture is there are generally gonna be a lot of high startup and operations costs associated with uh, doing, product, doing indoor aquaculture production, especially away from the coast. Uh, we have temperature control, which is an advantage, but to get that temperature control, we have to insulate. So you can see this building here. Oh, please, you're not working. Um, our, one of, this is one of our research buildings that's been spray foam insulated. It was a greenhouse, we converted it to a uh, indoor aquaculture production area. But again, that costs money. Um, filtration units can cost a lot. We have a lot of specialized equipment in aquaculture. Uh, water use can be very costly, especially when you're mixing in your own salt. Uh, again, salt mixes. Waste disposal can be difficult, especially for brackish water marine producers. We can't do anything with salt, uh, salt water waste. You can't dump it on a field. Uh, a lot of municipalities don't like having salt water discharge in the sewer system, things like that. And then the tanks themselves can be costly. If you start looking at fiberglass tanks or plastic tanks and you, add, you know, multiply that by 12, the cost adds up very quickly. So where can we cut costs in indoor aquaculture? Uh, reoccurring costs, especially in brackish water aquaculture, are one of our, our main areas uh, where we can look at cutting money. It's the reoccurring costs are a significant majority for brackish water producers, about 65%. And those main areas are the feed, the heat, the salt, and water. Um, and then in general, producers can also build their own tanks, don't just buy stuff off the shelf. Um, there's a lot of ways that we found to, you know, use tanks for aquaculture that really weren't meant for that purpose. So here's an example of that. Um, these are two shrimp farms in Kentucky. Uh, one of the farmers actually bought swimming pools, the picture on the right. Uh, these are swimming pools off Amazon, and they cost, you know, about 15% of what a similar sized aquaculture production tank does if you're getting something that's made out of fiberglass. So huge cost savings there, especially when you consider he bought all of his tanks for the cost of one of our fiberglass tanks. And he's got a nine tank set up in his building right now. On the left is a farmer that spray foam insulated a uh, old mechanics garage and actually built frames out of wood for his tanks, just out of two by fours, and bought pond liners, which are cheaper, or sorry, pool liners, um, dropped them in, 
and essentially built the tanks for about $300 each. So, you know, huge cost savings right up front. Um, oh, and then just to mention, the farmer on the right is actually using an old tobacco barn. So uh, all those shrimp tanks are in an old tobacco barn that's been insulated, and the ceiling's been dropped down some. So, you know, reusing existing infrastructure. You don't have to build a dedicated new building. So looking at the systems themselves, um, clear water recirculating systems um, can be very expensive. You have a lot of filtration that's necessary to maintain that clear water. You're gonna generate a lot of waste and anything that's captured is taken out of the system. So you don't get like nutrient recycling, which we can have in some styles of systems like a hybrid or a bioflock system. So these hybrid systems are much simpler um, and all those solids that remain in the water can actually be converted into microbial biomass, which then a lot of species of aquacultured animals can eat. So shrimp and tilapia are two of the main ones that can actually eat microbial particles out of the water that would have been taken out of the system as waste and get converted back into food. So getting into the, the filtration side of things, <coughs> Waste discharge is really where you're gonna lose some money because your waste discharge from the system will always contain water and losing water is losing money. So if we can concentrate the solids in our filters as much as possible and remove as little water as possible, we're gonna keep water, we're gonna keep salt and you know reduce our costs. Um, we're also looking at a bunch of low cost kinds of filters. So taking you know, containers that are meant for other purposes and using them as filters, because again, aquaculture specific stuff is very expensive. So if you look at these filters here, we've got a foam fractionator on the right, um, the white PVC, which essentially just uses bubbles to clean the water. We built that out of PVC that we got from Lowe's. Real simple, real basic. On the left, um, we've got a biofilter that the black container is a 55 gallon drum that was used to store some kind of food liquid, you know, like juice at one point. Um, and now we're using it as a filter. It costs you about 10 bucks at a farm sale. So, you know, real cheap, real basic, but works well. So getting into the solids filters, um, this is a settling chamber. So it's very basic. Uh, the settling chamber is the blue container on there. Um, it's a really basic technology where we're just using gravity to settle solids out on the bottom of that filter. And we don't clean it every day. We'll clean it about once a week, which lets the sludge compact down to where the majority of it is actually solids as opposed to being like a really loose liquid. Um, more concentrated sludge, less water use, more cost savings. And here's just a wire diagram of the way the settling chamber work. We've got water coming in from our, uh, our production tank at the top, through the center baffle, the water's forced to the bottom, and then is forced to rise back up to leave the settling chamber. Gravity does its thing, we end up with a nice big layer of sludge on the bottom, which we can just easily remove by opening a ball valve at the bottom. So real basic, real simple. And on to foam fractionators. Same thing, foam fractionators are, you know, we've learned to build them ourselves, build them in a really low cost method. Um, we have a bunch of homemade designs that we can provide to farmers. They operate off the existing air supply you already need for your systems anyways, and it'll complement the settling chamber operation. Foam fractionators will remove small solids really well. Uh, settling chambers remove heavy solids. Um, and these are even more concentrated. The foam itself is actually fairly dry. I know people think of like soap suds as being wet, um, but the, what, the material that comes out of these is actually very tacky. It's a really sticky substance and there's not a lot of water in it, which is great for farmers. So another real simple wire diagram of a foam fractionator that we've designed in house that just again runs off the existing air supply on your system that it needs already. Um, real basic, water comes in from the tank, it sets in that, inside that center chamber, the bubbles pass through it, collect waste as they go, and then the bubbles fall out the top. So here's an example on a shrimp farm um, of 55 gallon drums being used as filtration systems. So what we have here is two of them plumbed into each other. The first one is a settling chamber, the second one is a biofilter. So in our systems, we need a biofilter to house beneficial bacteria that essentially clean the water for us. Um, but again, you know, you've got two containers there and some PVC pipe and you've invested maybe 50 bucks into your, your filtration system as opposed to something off the shelf uh, that's aquaculture specific that could cost you 500 up to 5,000. Prices get crazy real quick. So again, just another real basic model that we, we and our farmers have found a lot of success with. So on to some of our real major cost saving areas, the salt mixes are a huge one that we've done a lot of research on the last couple years at KSU. So the commercial salt mixes most people use in aquaculture are made to mimic seawater exactly. So there's a ton of trace minerals, there's micro macro minerals, 
Um, these salts are proven over decades. Salt water really hasn't changed much in either of these salt mixes. They work really, really well, and they're kind of the industry standard. However, they're very expensive, especially when we look at the cost of including all those trace minerals into the salts. So can we make our own salt mixes? Can we make something way cheaper? And it turns out we can. So we've helped, or we've developed and tested um, what we call the least cost salt mix. Um, and it's simplified down to six ingredients, and we've limited it to specific elements that we know shrimp have to have. Um, now, this formulation is specific to Pacific white shrimp, but there are very, very similar, almost identical mixes that have been used for a lot of fin fish, like red drum, pompano, flounders. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a, a more universal than you think. Um, but the ingredients on the right are real basic. We got table salt, uh, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, things that are not hard to find. Uh, a lot of these ingredients are actually available at local feed stores. So you can go down the street to Woodford Feed and Versailles and pick actually six of the, or five of these ingredients up. They have them in stock. Um, for the ingredients themselves, uh, food and animal grade is preferred. And, you know, being in a, Kentucky's an ag-focused state, a lot of, we have a lot of these ingredients that are made specifically for cattle or sheep, or things like that. Um, technical grade ingredients are the best because they're guaranteed to be a certain purity level, but they're also very expensive. So the food and animal grade works. Industrial grade, you have to be careful with because it's made for industry. There can be contaminants in it, which we've had issues in the past with some suppliers. Um, so the ones that we've had success with are actually listed on here. Um, the brand, the compound that we're getting from them. Um, and yeah, again, if anybody would like this information, we can provide it to you as well. So just to compare the, the costs here, so this is an example, this is our raceway um, that we have uh, at Kentucky State University that we do saltwater shrimp production in. So it's about 5,200 gallons or 20 cubic meters of water. So we're using a commercial sea salt, it's gonna cost me just over 25 bucks per cubic meter to salt this um, the, the way I like to. So if I wanna get it to 15 parts per thousand salinity or half strength seawater, it's gonna cost me 500 bucks. Uh, to get it to 30 PPT, or full strength seawater, it's gonna cost me over $1,000. Using the least cost salt mix, it's gonna cost me about nine bucks per cubic meter. So to raise the whole tank to 15 parts per thousand salinity, cost me $176 or $353 to get it up to 30 PPT. So about a 65% reduction in cost, um, which is huge considering that a lot of time you're gonna be reuse or you're gonna be getting rid of this water year after year. So. One of the things we fight in indoor aquaculture production is nitrate buildup. And nitrate buildup is completely normal in RAS operation. Um, it's due to the waste from the animals being converted from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Again, this happens in every aquaculture system ever made. Um, it's excreted from the animals you're culturing. And normally we control it with periodic waste or water discharge. So if you've ever had a fish tank, people say you need to perform a water exchange every couple weeks or something like that. Same thing here, it's just on a much larger scale where we're talking about discharging hundreds of gallons as opposed to like five gallons out of your fish tank. The issue here, we're losing water, we're losing salt, and in marine aquaculture, brackish water aquaculture, it's really hard to deal with that salty waste. We can't use it as fertilizer. Again, municipalities don't like salt water coming into their, uh, their sewer systems. So it can be difficult. So we wanna reuse that water as long as possible. So we've also done a lot of denitrification research. So what we're doing is we're utilizing bacteria already in the system, but putting them in a very different environment. So when our nitrate levels get to a specific point, usually past where the animals are tolerant of it, we'll shut the system off, turn the air off, turn the pumps off, and we'll just let the water go stagnant which normally is a really bad thing. But what we can do is if we calculate the amount of nitrogen in the water, we can basically set the carbon nitrogen ratio in the system by adding in some kind of organic carbon, like sugar or ethanol, so alcohol. Um, and what that does is all the microbes that were uh, converting ammonia to nitrate in the system will start converting nitrate to nitrogen gas and essentially reverse the whole process. Um, now, we're in Kentucky. We have a lot of ethanol in the state. Almost every single distillery is cranking out millions of gallons of ethanol a year. So it's pretty cheap and easy to get. Um, 
So this graph shows a study we actually did on a shrimp farm. So this was a shrimp farm that's actively producing in Kentucky, where we went from 500 milligrams per liter of nitrate to z almost zero in f just a week, eight days, which is really impressive considering it took over a year to build up the nitrate to that point. We got rid of it in a week. Uh, and essentially that water is ready for reuse. So we took what would have cost the farmer $1,000 to replace all that water. Um, now they spent about $30 on ethanol is what it took. So it was a 4,500-gallon uh, shrimp system. We used 35, 34.7 liters of ethanol. And again, ethanol is cheap. Uh, I can get online right now and buy 264 gallons and an IBC tote of uh, 190 proof ethanol for about 1,000 bucks or a dollar per liter. So I'm cleaning that whole tank for 35 bucks as opposed to replacing all that salt for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So just to give an example of adopting some of these things into a commercial operation, if you have nine tanks that you're growing shrimp or uh, another kind of brackish water species in, um, it's gonna cost you about $4,000 a year to use a commercial sea salt if you're replacing that year after year. Uh, it's only gonna cost you about $1,300 total if you use the low cost salt. So you're saving 2,500 bucks right there. If you don't go through the, the route of replacing your water every year and you denitrify, it's gonna cost you $336 in ethanol and you're saving another thousand bucks as opposed to replacing that salt again. So, you know, these are real simple methods to actually save a lot of money that's in your reoccurring costs in the long term. So one other way to get rid of nitrate, um, we're not as far along with this as we are denitrification and the salt replacement, um, but we have been doing some brackish water aquaponics, and we're gonna talk a lot about aquaponics today as well in some of the other talks. Um, but brackish water aquaponics um, really hasn't been a thing for a while uh, because plants don't grow well in salt. So we can use some kinds of uh, salt tolerant plants that are found on the coast, but there's really not a market for those. Uh, but we found that kale is actually grows really well in brackish water. Um, and by really well, I mean it survives, which is, is really well for most plants. Um, but uh, this has the potential to offer farmers an additional source of income, so you can actually make money off the nitrate as opposed to spending money to get rid of it. Um, but again, you know, this is kind of ongoing research, but it's, it's something that's really interesting, and we've actually gen we've had a lot of people interested in this research and have reached out to us about it, so I threw it in here just because. But... Um, that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this morning. Um, and if you have any questions, we have a bunch of YouTube videos. Um, we're also on Facebook. And you can contact me directly at leofleckenstein at ksu.edu. <laughs> questions? Anybody? Okay, you got one. So, actually, I can go back to the pictures of it. This should be on there. That's possible. Um, if People online didn't hear that. The question was, uh, the kale looks darker when it's grown in salt water. Uh, would it be perceived as more valuable? Honestly, I couldn't answer that. Um, we were, we've reached out to a couple of food scientists um, in Ohio and at the University of Kentucky. Um, so we're actually starting a couple batches of kale to send to them to start doing some of that market research on to see what people would pay for it and how they would perceive it. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, it's actually very tasty. Um, if you fry it up, or you don't even really need to fry it if you just throw it in the oven and bake it like you would kale chips, it tastes kind of like french fries. So, pretty good. Any other questions? Um, I was thinking maybe if you could go back to the swimming pools with them. So maybe folks would like to kind of know how much, like, how many shrimp they can grow, like what the production cycle is of the shrimps, and, and what, pr what producers are doing, where they're selling them, stuff like that. Absolutely, so uh, the systems you see here are, are pretty much the model that most producers in Kentucky have adopted. So these are 4,500 gallon swimming pools, or we work in metric a lot of times, so 20 cubic meters of water, or sorry, 17 cubic meters of water. Um, 
these pools are off Amazon. Um, I don't know what the prices look like right now, but usually they bounce between $600 and $800, depending on the season. Um, they're, they're very simple, um, and they're basically just made to hold water. So we recommend farmers start out at lower densities because you know, you're learning a completely new industry. So uh, we, we usually don't recommend you stock the tank to the brim and, and see how many pounds of shrimp you can get out of it. Um, so we usually recommend stocking about a shrimp per gallon of water. So about you know, four to 5,000 shrimp in this tank. Um, if you have like average survival, so between 70, 75 percent, um, you're going to get about 180 to 200 pounds of shrimp out of this tank every 90 days if you're stocking it back to back. Um, you know, again, very low cost tank. Uh, you're using 55 gallon drums as your filters. Um, you know, really, really basic setup uh, that's been working pretty well. So our farmers in Kentucky uh, have reported that they're selling between 18 and, or 16 to 18 dollars a pound, and a lot of that sales is directly to consumers through farmers markets. Um, but they have had success selling bulk to uh, different kinds of, you know, like grocery stores or especially Asian markets seem to really appreciate the value of having fresh shrimp. So they, that's been a, a partnership that's been very successful for the, the farmers in Kentucky. Um, they've, the, our farmers have reported that their cost is six to eight dollars a pound. Now we haven't researched that. That's just their reported numbers. Um, and there have been a lot of uh, studies in the past um, that are, you know, from ten plus years ago. That when this industry was really getting uh, its feet under it, the costs were much higher um, for production. So, uh, but the numbers that we've received from our local farmers in Kentucky, um, they're usually between six to eight dollars a pound of reoccurring cost. That's what they're. That's what it costs them to grow up on a shrimp, and they're selling for sixteen to eighteen. So. But yeah, if you have nine tanks, you're you know hopefully harvesting three or four times a year, about 200 pounds out of each one. So you can do the math; it ends up being quite a bit of shrimp. So, what about the size? Like, how many shrimp do you grow them out to jumbo size? Like, is it? Yeah. So um, the the studies that have been done in, for the U.S. shrimp market are uh, indicate that p consumers want jumbo shrimp. So we're looking between 24 to 26 grams. Uh, per shrimp, which gets you about an 18 count per pound, and that that appears to be the uh, the favorite size for U.S. consumers. So, now Central South America are very different, but in the U.S., especially you know Midwest, uh, Southeast, those areas like jumbo shrimp. So, any more questions, Andrew? You were talking about the least cost salt mix, and have you guys run any um, actual production cycles after going through with the least salt mix as well as the denitrification? Did there was there any hidden aspects of the denitrification and least salt mix, like interactions with one another in terms of decreasing production or things of that nature? No, okay, there it goes. Um, there, there are. So, um, when you pour a bunch of energy basically sugar or organic carbon in your system, it's gonna grow a lot of stuff. Um, so we do have a lot of solids, which we have to filter out after the denitrification process, which takes about two days of, of normal filter operation. Um, we have seen calcium consumption, um, and we found that it actually, that, that process causes the calcium to precipitate out of the water and settle on the bottom. Um, but w with the low cost salt mix, the nice thing about it is we don't have to dump in like a whole box of pre-made salt. We can actually pick individual ingredients and dose those back up as needed. So as opposed to dumping in a whole box of you know commercial sea salt that's costing you 25 bucks, you can take you know a, a bucket of a uh, you know calcium chloride mix that costs you 10 bucks and and pour in a quarter of that. You know just amend as needed. Um, so yeah, there are some little nuances to it, um, but I figured I wasn't gonna get super deep into the weeds today about all that. So. Any other questions? Yes. Leo, do you have plans to use a, like an economist, ag economist, in part of the studies to analyze from our perspective what it would cost per pound to raise them? Maybe you've already done that. I, I can't remember. Um, so we have on our end, but our end is very different than the practical side of things in the field. So we do want to bring in people and actually look at our farm operations um, like under a you know microscope um, 
one of the issues is this, the, again, this industry is relatively new and is changing so quickly that even the cost of post-larval shrimp, um, you know, again, the, one of the studies I was talking about that was a, a little over a decade ago now, their cost of post-larval shrimp was the majority of their cost, and it was 10 cents per shrimp, which is crazy. Right now, with the nursery process that we run and that we show farmers how to run, our cost is under a cent. Um, so it's, I mean, that right there is a huge difference. Um, I think one of the, the study that, um, that I'm referring to had post-larval shrimp being like 18% of your reoccurring cost each year, which is just wild. Um, so uh, we would like to bring in people, economists and, and you know, look at it from our perspective as opposed to just using the farmers reporting their numbers. Um, but again, it's the industry is changing so quick that like the numbers I gave you right now from this year could be completely different two years from now, just because there's more technology going into it. It's getting cheaper. Um, you know, we're developing new things all the time, like lease cost salt, which is, you know, cutting a couple thousand dollars off your operating bill every year. So, um, but yeah, we'd like to. <laughs> around the profession, around the industry is that it, it is profitable. I mean, you know, it's uh, uh, rolling pretty well, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, the farmers we have have been sticking with it now for several years. Jason Whitus at Rolling Blue Farm has been in operation for six years now. Um, Sildon Well, Andre Fall is doing real, just expanded, actually built a new building dedicated to shrimp. Um, so, and we've got a lot of farmers outside of Kentucky that we work with as well that, you know, have adopted the low-cost salt mix. They're performing denitrification, and we're getting a ton of great feedback from that as well, so talk about how much money they're saving just, just with those two techniques alone. So, yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Leo. That was a great presentation. I know I am very excited to see shrimp on our menu at KSU occasionally. <laughs> so, best part about doing shrimp research at KSU is we get to take the shrimp home after it's over. <laughs> um, well, I am actually up next, um, and today I will be talking about acclimating fish to an aquaponics system. So, uh, my name is Janelle Hager, and I am a, a state specialist for aquaponics here at the university. Um, and I work with both, re both research and extension in aquaponics. So if you have any questions about that or um, about our farmers around the state, please let me know. Um, in my presentation, though, I am going to be addressing one of the questions I get the most, um, and we'll walk through that. So do I go here? Oh, OK, great. I didn't realize that I was in control of that slide. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, so, you know, with aquaponics, it's becoming a more popular technology. Um, when I started working at KSU in, here in 2014, I think, um, there were two or three aquaponic farmers in the state, and now we have over 10 aquaponic farmers, and that's just the kind of ones that I know about. Um, most of them are in larger greenhouses, but we do have a couple indoor producers, so um, it's definitely a, farming technology that is growing. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it becomes so popular, or it has become very popular, is that it can be, you can do it in the backyard, you know, so it can be for home use and you can go all the way up to multiple greenhouses. So um, I have an aquaponic system in my backyard and I love working with it. Um, and then I think one of the largest aquaponic farms in the country is Superior Fresh in Wisconsin that raises Atlantic salmon and they have over six acres of greenhouse under glass where they do lettuce and leafy green production. So it's really sizable and I think that that's one of the benefits is that it's easy to understand but it can actually go up into this like commercial level of technology. So I just want to give a brief overview of just kind of what aquaponics is. So I'm going to see if our point, ooh, okay, that is interesting. Um, 
It's like a delay on it, sorry. Okay, so um, aquaponics is a technology that combines recirculating aquaculture systems and hydroponics. So a recirculating aquaculture system, this is the basic um, operation, is you have a fish tank. Uh, you need to remove all of the solids out of the system, so that's anything that can settle by gravity or floating in the water. Um, a biofilter that Leo talked about a little bit, which is where our beneficial bacteria do their work. So they convert all that toxic uh, ammonia products that the fish produce, and they uh, convert it into nitrate, which is what our plants want. And then there's a sump. So, well, this is just a RAS system, so there's no plants, but, um, and then with <coughs> aquaponics, we're just adding that plant component on there. And so <coughs> um, this is, basically the system that allows us to get rid of all of that nitrate in the water. So typically in recirculating aquaculture systems, you're just looking, you're looking at, those are classically defined as 10% or less of the water, ex water exchange per day. So that's, that means you're taking out and replacing less than 10% of that water volume per day. In aquaponics, we typically run less than 1% water exchange per day. So, and some of the technology that we're, imp we're implementing, really low cost technology, is actually allowing us to have a zero discharge system, or pretty close to it. So, um, this is basically what an aquaponic system looks like. There's a lot of different components that you can replace this with. This is what's called a floating raft culture. Um, but they have a media system where your uh, plants are growing in, you know, kind of like rocks, if you will. It's not really rocks, but it's like an artificial media. And there's NFT, which looks like a rain gutter, basically. Um, so one of the biggest questions that I get, and it's so stressful for both people and for the fish, is how, like, how do I acclimate our fish to aquaponic systems? You get these fish, you make your investment, you want to put them in your tank, and if you don't do it the right way, all of your fish get sick and die. So that's a pretty stressful process for both our producers and for, um, you know, the, the fish as well. So fish and recirculating, now I've talked about recirculating aquaculture and aquaponics. It doesn't matter what system you're using, the process of acclimating your fish is the same. So this, what I, whatever I talk about here is applicable to both of those systems. Um, but our fish are completely dependent on our ability to keep them healthy in these systems. So there's no outside controls that happen. I mean, there's no, um, everything is controlled by the outside is what I meant to say. You know, in a pond, they can kind of go to different places of the pond. If the temperature is not right, they can go deeper, things like that. But in our recirculating systems, they rely on us to keep their temperature right, the water quality right, the clean environment. Um, the amount of oxygen they need, and the pH as well. So a lot of those water quality parameters. So if we can acclimate those fish, take them from one environment and put them into our system um, with reduced stress, we can also reduce the mortality, which you know, ultimately makes our fish happier and where we can get them up to the point where we can sell them and hopefully make some money. So, um, and other reasons why we wanna <coughs> really be aware of how we're acclimating our fish is that we don't really wanna do, uh, introduce anything harmful into our system. Um, and once you put, once, like, whether that's a food safety issue, whether it's bacterial disease, whether it's algae, you know, duckweed, whatever it is in our system, once it's in there in a recirculating system, it typically tends, tends to stick. So uh, we do have the ability to clean out our systems, but like I said, it's, uh, you know, we operate on a very low water exchange rate, so we want to keep that water in there. Um, and to prevent that disease and mortality, when we're introducing fish, um, we need to use good husbandry, husbandry practices, and that's what we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a lot of, we get, uh, another question we get a lot is where can I buy fish? <laughs> so there's a few different sources where you can get your fish from. So pond stocking companies, um, as you can see, a lot of those are grown in either ponds or raceways. Um, a hatchery, so that picture in the middle is from Americulture in New Mexico. They're a tilapia hatchery that produces all male tilapia. And then research facilities like we have at KSU. So we spawn fish out for research purposes and we can often um, put them out on a bid or donate them to specific folks in order to stock their systems. But what, I, so a lot of these are, you know, you're gonna have to manage that acclimation period a little bit different. Um, if you're getting fish from a pond, you can imagine that they come in with a lot of stuff on them. So like snails, for example, a lot fish are often intermediate hosts in the snail's life cycle. So the snails can come in on the gills, you can get bacteria from the pond that comes in. 
um, algae, things like that, that you might not want in there in your system. Um, in a hatchery environment, like anything with intensified um, agriculture, not just aquaculture, um, when you grow organisms or, or grow fish in a small enclosed area, you want to make sure that um, you're really not bringing any fish disease that come in and with those fish. And even with research facilities, you know, we have people coming in and out of our research facility all day long, every day. And so that can also be a source of contamination in your system. So we want to make sure when we stock our fish, they're as healthy as possible. Um, so how do you get your system ready to stock fish in? So you're, if it's a brand new system, or even if you've modified your system in some way, we want to make sure it's running with no leaks. Once you put fish in there, it's really hard to fix leaks in your system. So we want to make sure that like, our system is operational and ready to, to receive fish. Um, we want dechlorinated water. So a lot of our water here has, uh, you know, if you're using city water, it has chlorine in it. You can really just put an air stone on that, or air, aerate the water, and it'll blow off all that chlorine, evaporate the chlorine out. Or you can use a chemical additive um, and get rid of the chlorine that way. Um, and we also want to make sure that our temperature and pH are in the optimal range for the species that we're stocking. So this is a table from our aquaponics production manual that we put out last year. Um, and I just want to highlight that um, there are a, a vital range for most fish, which just means that that's their survival zone, the upper and lower limits of their survival zone. And there's also an optimal range. So we want to make sure that the fish are in their optimal range um, for whatever species they are. And so that can depend on what kind of species you stock, whether it's um, Nile scalopia, like koi, carp, uh, catfish, uh, trout, whatever it is, they're going to have those different temperature ranges and pH, but mostly temperature is important. Okay, so transporting fish. So um, a lot of times what we'll do when we're transporting fish to keep them healthy is to use salt on them. And that will reduce any handling stress of the fish and prevent disease. So what that salt does is it causes the fish to create this slime coat or this mucus coat on their body. And that'll kind of prevent them from introducing, like if they get nicked with a net or something like that, or they're flopping around in the net together, it kind of prevents any damage to the fish. So this picture here is actually a picture of um, a largemouth bass that one of our professors, Dr. Ken Simmons, who is giving the tour of the Impon Raceways later, they were looking at holding and handling stress on fish. So what he's done is they, he made a little nick mark in the fish and with a, like a small scalpel and then um, scooped the fish out with a net and they applied this fluorescent dye over the fish so you could see the damage to the fish um, that might not be visible to your naked eye. So you can see anywhere where there's like this light area represents like wiping that mucus coat off or some kind of damage to the fish. So just by handling stress, you're really going to, um, handling the fish, netting them up, putting them in the water, you're going to create stress on that fish. And so I think that's a really cool example of something that we can't really see, but definitely is going on. So that's kind of why we want to um, use salt, is to prevent that kind of damage on the fish itself. Um, also want to use clean nets, make sure they're sanitized. Um, a lot of snails come into our aquaponic systems. If you're using, like at our facility, if you're using uh, nets in the pond and then you like to take it up to my greenhouse and I want to net fish or the pond their fish from the pond or going into the greenhouse you know they can be transported on those nets and any aquatic veg vegetation as well um, we want to prevent overcrowding during oh sorry and the, um, not not feeding 20 hours before you transport fish so that will um, reduce any of that stress on them as well uh, to prevent overcrowding during transport, that's like super important because the oxygen in the water is going to decrease as those fish start respirating um, heavier. Uh, the temperature of your water matters too. If you're transporting fish in the summer, the oxygen could potentially be lower because warm water um, holds less oxygen than cold water does. Uh, tilapia are typically sh uh, transported at quarter, or four pounds per, 0.4 pounds per gallon or half a pound per gallon, but that's pretty um, st heavy stocking. So you might want to consider going lower, especially if you're only transporting a few fish. So receiving fish. If you have a quarantine tank set up, you want to keep your fish in that tank for one to two weeks before adding them to the system. That's a tank that is completely offline completely separate water, 
not mingled in with your main system. Um, and then if you see any disease issues pop up, you're able to treat them in there rather than treating them in your system. So for aquaponics specifically, it's really difficult to treat fish once they get sick in aquaponic systems. So our common methods like a chemical treatment, medicated feed, or even a salt bath, we can't really use those in aquaponics. So we wanna make sure that the fish we're bringing in stay, are and stay healthy. You wanna, if you're getting from a supplier, like if I'm taking fish to a farm, I always ask them, what's your pH and temperature? So that way we can kind of match those P, that pH and temperature as we um, are in transport or once we get to the farm. Water temperature should be within two degrees Celsius or around four degrees Fahrenheit of your receiving water and within 0.2 pH. Um, if fingerlings are shipped in a bag, which uh, often fry are, you can see this picture down here. Um, if they're shipped in a bag, there's only really enough oxygen to last them tr through that transport process. So we wanna make sure that we get them in, into our system and start acclimating them uh, pretty quickly. All right, so how, how do we go about equalizing temperature and pH? It's like a delay. <laughs> um, so pH is a measure of how acidic or base this solution is on a scale from one to 14. So acidic is down in the one area, you know, the lower end of that scale. And if you have an alkaline solution, it's at the higher end of that scale. Um, the one thing I wanna point out about pH is that it's measured on a logarithmic scale. So if, you're in, if the pH of your incoming water, so if my, my water is eight and a half, um, oh, I didn't put my 6.5, sorry, in my presentation. Um, if, my, if the incoming water is eight and a half and the receiving water, so your water on your farm, is six and a half, um, the difference is 100 times more, not two times more, right? So it's really important to, if you have a, like a 1.0, difference in pH, that's 10 times more, uh, the, more of a change than you know, the, the two waters. So it's really important to be able to actually you know, understand, understand what pH is and how to change it and how to acclimate your fish in order to keep them healthy. A lot of fish don't want to tolerate, will not tolerate a high pH change. So with, when you are acclimating fish and like adjusting that pH, you wanna do it really slowly. So no more than a 0.1 change every 30 minutes. If there's a large gap, you wanna extend this out longer. Okay, so how do we actually uh, change our pH in these systems? So one way we can do it is using sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. Uh, calcium or potassium hydroxide or carbonate can also be used. Um, and these compounds, so the chemicals, have a pH of, and a calcium carbonate is basically agricultural lime. That's what that is, so if that helpful reference. Um, and these compounds have a pH between 10 and 11. So in our 500 gallon research system at KSU, it takes only 14 grams to increase that, the pH by a level of 0 0.1. So I just want to highlight that because it doesn't take a lot of, of that compound to raise your pH just by a little bit. Um, if you need to lower your pH, so if you have your fish, like, you know, fish like a pH of about 8.5, that's kind of where their happy zone is. Um, our water here in Kentucky comes out of the tap at around 8.3. So, uh, you know, if you're going into a, an aquaponic system and you, in the pH is seven, you're gonna need to kind of lower that pH down. So one way you can do it is using reverse osmosis water. And you can, if you're regularly transporting fish, you can actually buy one of these for a few hundred dollars. Um, not not too expensive. Um, you can use phosphoric acid, aluminum sulfate, um, or even vinegar. So, and that also depends on the hardness of your water is how fast or how fast or what the fluctuation would look like when you change your pH. <clears throat> so it's also important to know that these are only temporary adjustments. So if your, your system is consistently running at a high pH and you're trying to lower it, um, if you add these chemicals into it, once those get used up by the bacteria or whatever in your water, you know, that pH is gonna come back up. So if you're in aquaponic systems or aquaculture systems, recirculating aquaculture systems, if your pH is consistently high, you have something going on in your system, right? So as, that, as those bacteria start converting all that uh, ammonia to nitrate, it adds hydrogen ions in the water, which makes your pH more acidic. So you're, we're constantly struggling to bring that pH back up, right? So 
Um, if you have, that's a whole nother issue with pH. If you have a constantly high pH in these systems, there's something else going on. Typically in aquaponics, it's a buildup of solids in your system. Okay, um, and then uh, temperature. So fish are poikilothermic or cold-blooded, which means they can't regulate their body temperature on their own. So they're dependent on whatever the uh, external environment is for their metabolism and the, the way that they regulate their temperature. So you can see that as the temperature, the, um, well, that's oxygen, sorry, that's not the other one, but, um, so, oh yeah, so temperature can also impact dissolved oxygen and the toxicity of ammonia. So you can see here what I was talking about earlier is the dissolved oxygen level, maybe, no? Okay, so the, <laughs> the colder the water is, basically the more oxygen it will hold. So the warmer it is, the less, less oxygen it will um, hold. So when we're equalizing our temperature, we want to make sure that if we're transporting or acclimating our fish in warm water, that we provide more oxygen into that system. Um, so temperature can also impact the toxicity of our ammonia. So if we have a high temperature and high pH, that there means that there's a greater proportion of that toxic ammonia in the water. So, you know, all of this to say is that water quality and understanding the relationship between temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen is really important when you're transporting, acclimating, or working with fish in general. So if you want um, like information about this, we have the aquaponics production manual, and it has a really great section on water quality that kind of goes into all this stuff. Um, so one thing that we ex discovered very recently was that we were moving koi out of our pond, which the water temperature was pretty cold, and we put them into our production building. We we're taking them to a producer um, in northern Kentucky. They were going to stock koi into their system. And so we put them in our production building, and we're going to slowly raise that temperature up. Well, we, it ends up that, you know, that temperature that we were raising them goes right through that disease threshold. So oftentimes, if you're in a pond, like, you know, raising fish in a pond or whatever, when that the water temperature is kind of creeping up to that between 60 and 70 degrees, you know, you're really uh, in that threshold for disease. And so all of our koi got sick and we had to, to treat them. So it's best if you're taking fish out of a pond to wait until the water temperature comes up a little bit and they can naturally get through that disease threshold. <clears throat> Um, the size of the fish are also important, so, um, you know, these are like a few different sizes, just like an example of different uh, aquafeed sizes. Um, if you're importing fry from a hatchery, you want to make sure you're using powdered feed and then gradually going up in size from there. Um, it's best to not feed fish for at least 24 to 48 hours after you stock them because they're super stressed out and they probably won't eat anyway. Um, but really small fish like fry that are coming in at one gram or, or lower, um, you know, they don't have enough body mass in order to sustain them for very long. So typically we are looking at feeding them four to five times a day and we start feeding those within a few, like, you know, eight hours of, of receiving them in. Um, so another thing you want to consider is blocking areas larger than the fish, so in pipes, pumps, things like that to prevent mortalities. Um, we discovered this, unfortunately, in one of our research systems. One of the fish was just big enough to fit through a pipe and got stuck in a pipe that was basically a dead end. So um, there was a lot of bad smells coming from that situation. <laughs> so um, best just to like stock fish larger than your pipes or kind of cover those with the mesh. Um, and then like I said, your feed should match that life stage. If you only want to buy larger feed and you're getting smaller fish in, you can just use a coffee grinder or whatever blender to kind of break that feed down and feed it at a smaller rate. So you don't have to go out and buy new feed. Um, so this is a, also a picture from our aquaponics production manual that kind of gives you a general idea of the different length, the, the weight, and then the feed size that you should use, and also feed frequency. Um, this is probably one of the most important things that I will talk about today, and that is acclimating your fish through the, the break-in cycle of your whether it's a small home aquaponic system, a, sm a small RAS system, or a giant, large, 
six acre farm, you're still gonna have to do the same process of acclimating your fish. And this is based, the basis of the nitrogen cycle. So you, have your, you stock your fish in the system in a new clean system, it basically doesn't have any, back, you know, any active bacteria in that system. So when you put fish in and you start feeding it, that protein in the fish feed is basically breaking down into nitrogen. You know, and that's, that whether it's released by the fish or just the breakdown of the feed in the water, you're getting a lot of nitrogen in the water. Um, the first stage is that ammonia. So that's basically what the fish is excreting. No? Oh, not that. Sorry. Maybe? Okay, here we go. So this is our first stage. So once that ammonia kicks in, that toxic ammonia, then the bacteria that are naturally in the system, they're like, oh yeah, that's my food source. I'm, I'm gonna eat. So then they start, you know, as that ammonia increases, then those other, those, um, nitro those bacteria that feed off that ammonia start, you know, building up their populations. You know, so then your ammonia starts going down because you have the bacteria established to eat, to kind of, you know, handle that load. Then the next stage is nitrite. So once the um, nitrite levels start going up, the bacteria that convert that into nit the nitrite into nitrate, they're like, oh yeah, there's our food source. And so then they start increasing in their population. So once they hit this critical threshold, they're kind of like, you know, consuming all of that nitrite in the water, it starts decreasing. And then the bacteria that can, you know, convert that nitrate to nitrate are like, oh, there, there I go, there's my food source. And so that's the basic proce process of the nitrification cycle, right? And so the nitrates, especially for aquaponics, is that's what we want. We want to, you know, convert all that nitrate into plants. That's what we want to do. And this takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight, right? So it takes about six weeks in order for this whole process to happen. So you can't just stock your system full of fish and think everything's gonna be okay, because I guarantee it's not. You're gonna either be doing lots of water exchanges or you're gonna end up with a lot of dead fish. <clears throat> um, so one thing you can do is actually adding um, water or media or something like that from an existing aquaponic system to kind of kickstart that bacteria and get it going a little quicker. The best thing to do is to, which I think I'm getting into my next slide here. Um, yeah, so you can stock about a quarter or a third of the capacity of your system and let your system cycle night, uh, naturally. And that way, once you get that population going, you can actually add more fish in um, and then eventually work up to your full capacity of your system. So that's um, my recommendation, is natural fish cycling. Um, but you still need to monitor your water quality for typically every two or three days until um, you start seeing nitrite be high and ammonia and nitrite be low. Um, so if you have high levels of nitrate, you can stop feeding, so stop adding that protein source that you know, produces that nitrogen, or you can do a water exchange, and it's important to have dechlorinated water on hand. Um, you can also need to mentally prepare yourself that you're gonna have some fish mortalities because that's just the nature of aquaculture, um, after, especially after handling stress. Um, you can remove any uneaten feed after 20 minutes. That'll prevent that feed from breaking down and adding to your uh, ammonia and nitrite levels. Um, and understand that fry and fingerling feed has a higher percent protein than the feeds you would generally feed at grow out, right? So that means higher protein, more nitrogen, more ammonia. Um, in addition, you wanna, um, for a few weeks after you stock, you wanna also watch for any disease because once you have any fish disease pop up in your aquaponic system, it's really hard to treat as I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, these are some of the common aquaculture diseases that we see, particularly in warm water fish. Um, so like tilapia, koi, largemouth bass, bluegill, catfish, things like that. Um, the first one on your left is the, that's a largemouth bass with the columnaris infection. That's a pretty typical thing that we call saddleback. Um, this is uh, another, like kind of that, it's the, where fish start losing their scales and their tissue becomes like almost like sores and that can actually spread all over the whole body. The fins start eroding. That's a really common sign of a, a columnaris infection is you can kind of see those fins are starting to erode back. This is pretty late stage. Like I don't, the fish are probably not coming back from that. <laughs> so um, worst case scenario. 
Uh, Saprolegnia is a winter fungus, so that's what happened with our koi, where they were going from like a colder temperature into like a warmer temperature. They were going right through that disease threshold. Um, it's typically characterized by uh, white cottony um, spots on the fish. And then a, another really common one, I know these are gross pictures, I'm sorry, it's uh, Aramonis, and that's uh, basically ulcers, where ulcers form on the fish. Um, they get really pale, and they'll have a lot of fluid in their abdomen. So those are just kind of like things that you're like, oh, my fish, his fins look kind of frayed, or uh, there's some spots on them. That's kind of, you really want to catch that early. The earlier you catch it, the better you're off, the less mortalities you'll have. Um, so just some other considerations. As soon as you put fish in, you put a cover on that tank because those fish are like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, Even if you put a cover on the tank, wherever your air stone comes in, those fish will follow those bubbles up and jump out. So you know, you've gone through all this work. You want to make sure we keep our fish actually inside the tank. Um, use a good quality fish feed, a complete diet. Often pond feeds are not a complete diet. They're a supplemental diet. Um, they, when you feed fish in a pond, they can go out and find other fish or insects or whatever, so um, we, we need a complete diet to keep our fish healthy. Uh, you want to make sure you store your feed in a cool, dark place, preferably a refrigerator, um, to prevent any toxins from mold growing on your, on your feed. Uh, soft mesh net, and um, another trick is that when you're actually moving fish, hold the net to prevent the fish from flopping around and um, getting more injured. So if you hold the net right above the fish, then you can transfer them into your tank. Um, and just one final thought. Um, these are general recommendations. So be familiar with your fish species because they will, it will change the way you handle fish. The things you need to do will change depending on your fish species. Um, some are more sensitive than others and um, will re require additional considerations to prevent mortality. Um, so that's my contact information. If you want any uh, information on aquaponics or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about aquaponics. Um, and then I just wanted to also bring your attention to some resources that we have out there if you're interested in learning more. Um, this is our aquaponics production manual. Uh, it's basically, if you don't want to spend eight hours on YouTube searching for stuff about aquaponics, just go there. It's all in there. Um, we have the aquatic farming newsletter that we're, we have, uh, Dr. Durbro has done for many, many years, and we are restarting that. Um, so if you would like to be included in our mailing list, please uh, contact me and I can put you on that. Um, it comes out quarterly, so our next edition is in July. And then uh, Dr. Ken Thompson and uh, Chelsea Walling have also worked on this aquaculture teacher's manual, and it's a full curriculum for um, high school teachers and high school classrooms. So there's some good resources on aquaculture and aquaponics that we've put out, so um, I hope you will utilize those. Um, any questions? Oh, good. You let me off easy. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Do you want, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, feel free if you need to get up and use the restroom. Um, we're going to plug through the rest of the program so we can get through it on time. Um, <clears throat> We, the next presenter we have is Andrew Lohman. He is a recent graduate of our aquaculture program in aquaponics, and he will be talking about a tool he used during his master's thesis, um, which is called a partial budget analysis, to help improve um, profitability on small farms and uh, make good business decisions regarding um, the changes you want to make. Hello guys, my name is Andrew Lohman, like Janelle said, and today we're going to be looking at the partial budget analysis that I used both at my research that I did, um, as well as on-farm stuff with Food Chain, which is a nonprofit aquaponic system um, within Lexington. So we'll just go through what is a partial budget analysis, just to get some brief ideas of what we're talking about here. A partial budget analysis is used to anal analyze one particular change within your system that you're using. It could be aquaculture, it could be agriculture, it could be whatever system you're using, but you're only going to be looking at changing one aspect of it. And in that change, you're going to be looking at what that one change does to increase your income, what it's going to do to reduce your cost, what it's going to do to inc increase your cost, and what it's going to do to decrease your income. Um, so you can use these resources to be able to 
make the best decision on what options to choose. And uh, sometimes there isn't available information. So in some situations when you're working in field agriculture, you can know if I swap out um, a particular type of feed for my cattle or for something else that if I have a certain amount of percentage of protein I'm changing it out I can have a fairly good idea of what that conversion is going to be um, but in this situation that we're looking at we're looking at um, using LED lights within aquaponic systems and we did not have any available information on how well those lights perform um, within these systems so we actually had to conduct trials to get those uh, actual operational costs for us to be able to do the partial budget analysis. So I'm going to be going through today um, looking at the trials that we actually did um, on the farm at Food Chain. So this is just very basically what a partial budget analysis is. You have your costs on the left and you have your benefits on the right. And on the additional costs, I'm just going to read it in case you guys cannot see it out there. The additional costs, these are costs incurred as a result of growing a new commodity or using a new practice. In this situation of this example, it's going to be lighting cost. Uh, reduced returns, these will be the returns that are given up as a result of no longer producing the current commodity being grown or produced or being used in practice. Um, so those will add up to our total cost. So basically that's going to be what we're adding in and what we're taking out um, of our current system. And then on the opposite side, the benefits, there's going to be any of the returns that we're going to see as a result of that change that we have made. So any of the, in this situation with the lights that we're looking at, it's going to be any of the additional lettuce that we're going to be producing underneath that light in comparison to the lettuce that we would have produced under a different light. And then finally, the reduced cost are going to be the costs that are no longer going to be incurred by using this new practice. So for the instance of lights, the um, most obvious one is going to be the operational cost of the LED lights. So you're going to be looking at how much kilowatt hours you're going to be using and the electrical cost that you're incurring uh, or not having to incur by using the old technology. So just a little bit of background of what this research was looking at. We were looking at trying to find inexpensive LED lights to be able to re replace uh, expensive horticultural lights. So we were trying to find um, lights that were a third the cost was around $400 or less could be easily purchased by anybody and could reasonably cover a four foot by two foot growing area for my research. And my research was in that four foot by two foot growing area, um, whereas at Food Chain, it's more along the scales of a commercial farm where you're going to be having a four foot by four foot area. Um, and we wanted to see in that food chain situation, that more commercial setting, if the lights that were effective in that four foot by two foot area would also continue over into the four foot by four foot area. So these are just the lights, just to give you an idea of where we're working with. We have our $80 lights at the very top, which we purchased from Royal King, and then the $1,400 lights that we purchased um, from a direct source uh, for horticultural lights. So you can see here the cost difference between um, the, the eight different lights that we're using with the control at the bottom, and then all the experimental lights above it. Um, and then just an, a, another, so when we're looking at um, selecting lights for this trial, we wanted to try to select the best lights in terms of both biomass production, because that's going to be our consumable crop at the end of the day, as well as the efficiency of those lights to produce that crop. Um, so that's what those highlighted, one, the, the two sections here that are the total biomass and grams per meter squared per kilowatt hour. The grams per meter squared per kilowatt hour is how many grams you produce per kilowatt hour in that space. Um, and all the ones that are highlighted are the ones that went on um, into the food chain trial, uh, which was a little bit different than our second trial at KSU, but those are um, the lights that we ended up choosing. So this is a picture of the farm at Food Chain. So they have uh, a typical aquaponic system off the UVI system, um, and they have four uh, raceways uh, for deep water culture, and they're 40 feet long, so you have 160 feet, is that right? 120 feet, sorry. Uh, no, 160 feet, that is correct. 160 feet of actual growing space. I um, mean, you can see here in the picture um, the varied color of the lighting spectrum. And one of the things that they are concerned about that isn't necessarily included in the partial budget analysis is the overall aesthetics of the farm. As they are a more or less a demonstration farm or a having a lot of tours coming through, they are concerned more so about how well things look and the actual present presentation of the farm as well as the production of it. Um, so this farm does not lend itself very well to photography, as is exampled by this photo. You have a lot of different colors, and the, the, camera, sh the camera struggles to take good quality pictures as well as good quality videos to be able to produce um, for their uh, actual promotion, as well as for people to share online when they come to the farm. 
Um, so this is an, just an example of what the trial looked like. So all of the stuff that we were using was in one singular trough and everything was segmented um, with black plastic so that all the light in there was uh, only for that particular light source and there was no bleed over between the other system lights or other experimental lights. And then this is just another design aspect of the system, just showing you um, where the water's coming in and the lights that we're using. So if you recall back to what I mentioned before, and I, this will, you'll see this over again in the actual presentation, um, in our trials at Kentucky State, uh, the designer and the fluence lights, we only needed one light for a four foot by two foot area, whereas at food chain in that four foot by four foot area, we had to have two of those lights. And they, uh, we tried growing them with a, a singular light there, but they were not sufficient to be able to do that. And we did not know that prior to going into um, this trial. We thought that it could be able to potentially cover that large area. Um, so that's why you see those two vertical lines. Those are the two lights and how they're oriented. And then the other three lights were all lights that had two lights that are able to cover that four foot by eight area. Uh, and that will come up later and we're looking at our partial budget analysis of the impact of having those two lights um, instead of being able to just use one light over that uh, singular area. So as I said, the, uh, we, we had some struggles initially and this is what will happen if you're trying to trial things uh, to get some information for your partial budget analysis. Uh, our first trial we had bad seedlings due to um, poor seedling management and our second trial uh, the harvest the plants were harvested too late, as well as the issues that I mentioned before. Um, the lights themselves, uh, we realized, were not adequate to cover some of the spaces, so we had to make adjustments to be able to figure out uh, what ones would actually work the best. Um, but in this situation, what we were looking at at the beginning, we had lights, <laughs> we had lights that were $1,400 that they were looking at replacing, and if they had to replace those lights, it would have been a very large cost for them to incur. Um, whereas this trial of lights that we're doing here for this partial budget analysis, they could end up saving on the lowest amount would be $1,100. At the highest amount, they could be saving $1,300 per light. So they're running this trial while it is using up a, a section of their actual production space. Um, it is worthwhile for them to be able to save, you know, $30,000 in replacing all those lights, which is a very long-term investment, as well as decreasing the overall um, electrical usage of those lights that they have. And then this is just, again, just so people could have an idea of what it would look like. We're making sure that everything is segmented and properly um, separated so that there was no bleed over and everything was as similar as possible so that when we go into that partial budget analysis, we can make sure that all of those things are accounted for and the only thing that is different is the actual light that we have um, in use in that particular cell. So these are just some pictures of the five different lights that we had. Um, we have the spider farmer light here. And you'll notice the different colorations of the lights as we go through and the different heights of the plants, or where the different height of the lights are. And that will also, as I mentioned before, um, the partial budget analysis is more of a guide for economics, but in their situation, there were non-economical things that they had to consider aesthetics-wise um, for the operation of their farm that may also play into um, a part in your operation, depending on what you are doing. So the spider farmer here, we have our control lights uh, with that purple color. Uh, when I was giving a, a practice presentation, I said a purple hue, but my wife assured me that it is actually very much purple. I'm colorblind, so I, uh, it's, uh, it was kind of funny. Was, I wanted to err on the side of caution because it doesn't look too purple. But anyways, very purple color. Um, and then you have the worldwides, um, which with these, so the previous two were horticultural lights, um, and this one here was a shop light or a, a high bay light that you would find in a commercial warehouse. These lights were also a shop light, and you can see here um, that issue that we had. This was taken in the first trials um, of we were not able to get light to those corner areas and had very poor production because of that. Um, and then finally, the fluence lights here. Um, similar thing, we only could have those two lights in that four foot by four foot area because they couldn't spread out to the four foot by eight area. Um, so these are the results that we um, had from um, the actual trial and you can see here there's a lot of information here um, but it's going down sequentially we have the amount of biomass produced the average plant weight the total kilowatt hours used per day the cost of that the, the actual value of that lettuce that if we could sell it the amount of uh, electricity that would cost per kilowatt hour and then we get into the actual crop cycles the electrical cost and the fixture cost and at the very bottom here, we have the, the net change in profits and the benefit cost ratio, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more, is that the, is that, as that is the large aspect of the partial budget analysis that we're looking at. 
So this is just a, a, a graphical representation of the actual production values of the, the lettuce. Um, because this will come back to play an important part um, later on in the presentation when we're looking at some of these lights and how, to, how the partial budget analysis may not necessarily give may not necessarily recommend to you the one that has the greatest production, but the one that potentially has the greatest economic savings at the end. So what is the partial budget analysis? The main thing that we're looking at, I mentioned briefly up top the, the, sec the cost and benefits section, but the main part that we're focusing on now is the analysis section at the bottom. And so that is going to be um, subtracting the total benefits from the total cost to get our net change in profits. And that's going to be the amount of money that we could potentially recognize in saving or incurring by making a particular change. And we'll get to an example here where you can actually see numbers plugged in um, into it from one of the actual trials so you can see what it actually looks like. And at the bottom, we have the benefit cost ratio, which is looking at a ratio of the amount of benefits versus the amount of cost that we have. And the greater that number is over one, the greater that um, option to choose the uh, alternative um, light would be for the actual farmer to use. So this here is the, one of the experimental lights um, with the control light that we had. So we have our purchase cost that we have to have for the designer's lights, excuse me. We have the operational cost for the designer's lights of that year. And then we have the reduced uh, returns of the, the neosol light production. So that gives us our total cost section for $257. And on the right hand side, we have the lettuce production that we would realize um, by using the designer's lights. And we also have the reduced cost of the purchase cost for the neosol, which is the control horticultural light. And we have our operational cost of that neosol that we do not have to incur if we don't use that. So we have a total benefits of $1,500. And this is just, again, for just one light um, to replace. So this is scaled up by however many lights or whatever type of system you're operating in. So the net change in profits here, just in this, this first year here, it would be a difference of $1,300 for um, the producer to go with the designer lights compared to the neosol. And a large majority of that, or majority of that cost that we're seeing here is that purchase cost of $1,400. The actual production value of the crops being grown in the situation is very similar, as well as the operational cost is also very similar. Um, and we'll go to the actual, um, so this is again just showing you, now that you can see where everything came from, you can see the numbers at the bottom, and we'll go to graphically where they are now. So this is looking at the benefit cost ratio and net change in profits um, of the food chain um, trial. So you can see here that all four of the lights that we tried out would all be um, beneficial options um, to choose uh, within the farm's operation. Some are going to be better than others. Uh, the taller the graph, uh, the bar on the graph, the, the greater the, the benefit is um, economically um, for the producer at the end of the day. As well as the net change of profits is the same thing. The, the higher the bar on the graph, the better um, option that is to choose for economic purposes. And so I just want to bring attention back to the comparison, comparing the two trials that we ran at Kentucky State where we had that four foot by two foot area and that four foot by four foot area. And you can see that there is a drop in the net change in profits um, between the fluence and designers that is very similar to the amount of the cost of that light. So the, the fluence light was about $360 and that will get you back up to about that same cost at KSU, and the designer's light was about $100, and that will get you back up to about the same cost um, at KSU. And so that additional, uh, adi that addition of a second light into the system um, was what is making up that large reduction in the net change in profits. Or as you can see with the spider farmer, for instance, we were able to use one light in both the four foot by four foot area at food chain, as well as the four foot by two foot area at KSU. And you can see here that there is very little difference between the net change in profits um, of this system. Additionally, I put the total biomass up here just to draw attention back to what I mentioned earlier, that a decreased production is not necessarily going to result in the best net change in profits. So even though the uh, fluence here has a 200 grams difference uh, in actual production compared to the wide, when we look at the net change in profits, for instance, um, there is about a $600 difference between there. And that is because that wide light is about $120 to buy for that four foot by four foot area. And that fluence light to be able to also do that same area was about $700. And that's where that large cost difference is. Even if something is um, producing more, it could not be the best, it may not be the best option um, based on purchase cost or operational cost. 
And this is again the same thing again. You can see it a little bit, uh, the same thing I mentioned earlier about the two lights again, uh, as well as the um, total biomass. And the spider farmer also did not really change much, whereas the designer's influence did fluctuate quite a bit uh, with that addition of that second light, about half, um, which makes sense because that takes up a large amount of their uh, cost. Um, so considerations, so th that was the partial budget analysis of it. And there's other considerations, like I said at the beginning, to take into, uh, to take into mind. Um, like I said, with Food Chain, they were concerned also about the light quality, um, how well they would actually be able to have tours come through. So um, even if the, the NeoSoul performed very well and it was well worth it um, to consider using, um, for their intangible aspects, their non-economical aspects of having people come through and having um, pictures being taken, the, the worthwhileness of those lights would not be justifiable because it makes it very difficult to have um, those pictures and quality videos to be able to share online. Um, secondly, the um, designers in this situation, again, was the best performing light in the situation. Um, but again, this farm is concerned about how well their presentation of their farm is. And if you have lights that are sitting you know, only a couple inches above the plants, it makes it very difficult um, to have adequate photos or to have good photos or to have, be able to s or to have people be able to see um, the plants underneath, because that's what they're coming there for. They want to be able to see the fish and the plants, and if you just have a sea of lights, it makes it very difficult um, to be able to showcase what an aquaponics system is. So these are some intangible aspects um, that aren't necessarily in a partial budget analysis that you need to be aware of um, in your particular operation, what, what those intangible aspects may be and how that impacts your overall decision. So the, uh, the farm actually ended up going with the, 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 the spider farmer lights to replace all of their old lights. And we'll see here in the picture um, what that looks like in comparison between one and the other. Um, the cost was significantly lower than the NeoSol, um, but the actual partial budget analysis for both the benefit cost ratio and the net change in profits uh, was not very different from the best performing light in that system. So these are a lot easier um, to record in and to take pictures in, as well as are more inviting for tours to come in. So we'll see here a before and after picture of the farm. Um, and you can see here the, just the, the pure color difference in the, in the presentation of the farm itself. Before it looks very discombobulated, um, a lot of just erratic colors and it's difficult to look through, but now everything is a single uniform light um, that is very conducive because it's a white light for videography or photography within the system as well as they're high enough up off the boards that people can actually see uh, the plants and be able to look through them and get up close um, and actually see what is going on in an aquaponic system rather than just having a bay of lights here. Um, and an additional thing that was uh, a factor for them um, is that they have a light louver which allows them to move their lights with a motor inside of their operation. Um, and if the lights on that, op on that louver is too, are too heavy, um, they cannot operate it. And by utilizing that louver, they could be able to move lights back and forth across an area and even use less light. So they were looking for a light that was both compact, um, low in weight, both for handling and for moving, um, as well as high enough up off the boards. And that's why they ended up with the Spider Farmer. Even though it was slightly less than the designers, it was still um, the best option both in terms of the partial budget analysis as well as in all of the um, non-tangible economic things um, like I said earlier. And that is my contact information. If you guys have any questions concerning this, I'd be happy to answer and uh, I'll take any questions now. Awesome. Oh, okay. Um, Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Uh -huh. It was a great presentation. Um, so, can you maybe? It's like a lot. We've I've heard I've seen you present this a couple times, and it's like a lot of stuff, right? Yes. A lot of numbers. But I think could you maybe go back to and just talk about the primary things that you need in order to com to to do this analysis? Yes. Yeah, I can. So that will be. I mean, because I think it's things that people generally collect. Correct. on their own and mm -hmm. it's just a matter of subtracting and then eventually dividing those numbers out, right? Right, so the in most situations you're going to have the ability to do this with the information that you're already collecting. If you, um, a lot, again like I was saying before, the lights that we have did not have a lot of solid data on what that particular pr production practice would have 
on the overall production of lettuce, whereas in your operations, you may have you, you know industry standards of like if you were to they gave um, examples online of like feeding between alfalfa hay or alfalfa hay um, versus like a, a trashier hay and how much that cost difference is between one to the other and what's the nutritional value of those two different things. And you can know pretty well by just plugging and chugging those numbers in um, what those additional costs are going to be and what those reduced returns are going to be. Um, and so it's, in most situations, you're not going to have to do a trial to be able to come up with those numbers. They're going to be either industrial standards or provided by the manufacturer um, or things that you're going to be collecting on uh, a day-to-day -day basis that you're going to be able to use as a baseline uh, to compare to those um, industry standards, particularly when you're looking at changing a practice. You're probably going to have a good idea of how much does this cost me to, to purchase, how much does it cost me to operate, how much is this costing me in labor, and all these other things um, that are tangible things that you would have already um, being recorded. like cut costs somewhere mm -hmm. or, you know, for aquaculture producers, we've talked about using it as a feed, you know, like looking at feed costs from year to year because mm -hmm. that like fluctuates a lot. So, right. um, yeah, thank you. Yes, and I also say that it's a lot less intimidating than a full budget analysis. When you're just looking at a singular um, thing that you're looking at changing out, it's very um, forgiving or uh, a lot more approachable to that aspect. You're not having a bunch of numbers you're having to go through. It's just very simple. I'm making one change and looking how that one change impacts everything else in our operation. Thank you. Okay, so we have one more presenter, and then we will do lunch. Um, and then I highly encourage everybody here to stick around for our tour of the floating raceways, which will be just down at the pond right here. Um, so we have, for those of you that are joining online, if you want to come back at 1 o'clock, um, we have a great cameraman that's going to take you all on a, um, a tour through your computers. So I hope that you'll uh, stick around for that. Um, one thing that I really love about this technology that we'll see down at the pond is that if you, I can't tell you how many times someone has come to me and said, I have a farm or a pond on my farm, like what can I do with it? Um, this is an option. So I think it's a really cool way for people to get into aquaculture on a small scale um, and add to their income. So um, without further ado, um, I want to introduce Jeffrey Warner, who is an um, extension associate here at KSU focusing on aquaculture genetics, and he is going to be talking about setting up a small-scale hatchery for tilapia production. So, thank you. So yeah, as she said, I'm Jeffrey Warner. I am a research and extension associate, and I work underneath Dr. Gamelski and Dr. Novello. Um, well, we have various kind of projects. Gamelsky primarily did koi research, is what I kind of did for my thesis, and then now we're going towards more of a tilapia background. Um, so, our non disclosure, our non uh, discrimination statement itself. Um, so, what is a tilapia? So, a tilapia is a group of fish that are um, a type of cichlid found in the African Rift Valleys. Um, its species are various types. They're, um, you have the Nile, the Blue, and the Mozambique, but we specialize in using the Nile tilapia itself. Um, this is actually a fish that's been cultured for over 3,000 years. It's been depicted in pyramids and such in Egypt. It's also called the St. Peter's fish or the Jesus fish because it was actually bred and uh, farmed during the time frame and locale that would have been the, or the biblical reference point. And this is also a rather important species to um, look and study because it is the second most produced food fish in the world. So with that, we have our capacity building grant, so that's why we study it. Um, a few years ago, we actually um, had mixed strains of various types of, uh, that we have they can commercially buy, and then we um, kind of checked the progeny, grew them up, had feed conversion ratios, kind of see which ones would grow fastest and whatnot. Then we also had a cross them with a super male. So give a little background of that. Tilapia are like humans, where we're X and Y chromosomes. So females will be XX, male will be XY. 
but through various methods of like sex reversal and breeding, you can get males that be a YY offspring. This is important because you can get an all male offspring by crossing that with a regular female because every offspring at that point will be X and Y. In theory, it works that way. There's a small percentage that actually will be female, but we don't really go into that a whole lot. Um, with that, we had a few crosses that actually produced very, very well. And then since that research was done, we are now doing the or implementing that into on-farm research. So we get the real world data for the actual growing out size and also market data and kind of coloration, our preferences for whatever fish we're doing. And so this data will be actually um, important to give out to stakeholders and such. So what are the basic needs of tilapia? So they are fish, they will need water. One thing, these guys are also extremely hardy so they can handle most anything else, but temperature. Temperature is the main thing that you kind of have to make sure that you kind of keep above. Um, you want to get around 85 degrees, that's what they really, really want to be at, but anything below 70, they will not consume any feed, and it actually starts getting them to where they uh, decrease their actual like immunity and such. Um, pH around 7.8, which is important, um, because they want to be in kind of the higher range. Here it works really well because we already have a natural um, alkalinity and hardness scale for them, um, so you can kind of get away with a lot of things. Um, and they are... They produce a lot of nitrogenous waste, and alkalinity is one of the key things that gets taken up by nitrogenous waste. We're remediating all that. So salinity-wise, they prefer like over two to three parts per thousand, uh, which is important because they can actually survive all the way up to 15 PPT, like brackish water, like Leo was talking. Um, but you don't have to have a whole lot in there, and so it's a good way to keep their slime coat up, keep their immunity up and going. Oxygen needs to be above P or 3 ppm, which is important, but it's also really easy to do with having just basic aeration in your tanks. Um, so when it comes to feeding these guys, they are omnivorous, so they'll eat almost anything you throw at them. They are, they, they just eat everything. So out in the wild, they'll eat whatever kind of plant matters out and around, so it's important that you can actually feed them proper feed but you can get away with a lot of different things. They're not like a large mouth bass. They don't have to have a high fish meal protein. You can get away with different plant meal proteins and plant oils and so on. Um, but we want to get like a grow out kind of thing or even getting your brood stock ready with a 36% fat, or sorry, 36% protein and a 6% fat. Um, and then actual, sorry, in the development of it, you'll go with a 40 and a 10, which is kind of important for these guys. Um, so, for conditioning your brood stock, you want to make sure you feed them to satiation. So feeding as much as they'll eat within like a five to 10 minute window. So they kind of fill up and fatten up as much as possible and have good production for all their eggs. But you also want to make sure you have your fish properly identified for your brood stock. This is really important so you don't get genetic bottlenecks and so you don't have problem fish, which I'll show you one a little bit. Um, so we actually use pit tags and these are kind of a cool thing where it's basically a little microchip you put your dog or your cat um, we had larger ones at one point, and then we have a bunch of smaller ones that actually use like a little gun that you get like an ear piercing at a Walmart. It's pretty fun to do. Um, but it's a great way to keep your actual like bloodlines and parentage records wise. Um, also, it's a great way to know when your females are, they will kind of cycle up with each other sometimes. You can kind of get the groups together that will actually spawn together. And it'll be a great way to know like when to weed out your actual bird stock because if they've done a few years worth of it, they may start having decreased egg production work quality of eggs themselves. So with our tilapia spawning, we'll show the, uh, we basically have to get them outside of our other broodstock tanks. These broodstock tanks are conical bottom, so they'll be coned towards the down at the bottom, so they won't spawn, which is really important, because these guys are mouth brooders. So the female will walk over, or walk over, she'll swim over, lay eggs, the male will fertilize, and she'll come back and scoop them up in her mouth. And this is important because then she will, um, keep water circulating over it to make sure they're properly oxygenated, but also won't have any kind of predatory situation because the other fish will eat them. And she'll do that while they hatch and even our fry. Um, when you guys are, or when we're sexing them, it's a bit difficult because it doesn't always work out. Um, wrong way, sorry. So right down here, so the male will have a more of an arrow-shaped papillae, and the female will have more of a rounded U. A lot of times those things get also nibbled on by other fish, so they get inflamed, it's really kind of hard to deal with. 
So when you're trying to extract them, it's a bit of a pain other than to like manually extract out gametes. So we have a lovely little method to check these guys out, and that's using the ultrasound. So Jasmine herself, she actually did a project where she was able to do sexing and then also change or check out the ovarian development and maturation with cytotopia. So she would check out the actual fish, image them with the ultrasound itself, and then freeze them and then bans all of them. With that, she will then do a um, histology slide and be able to kind of figure out exactly what level of actual egg production they have and what kind of stages they're at. So this is really important to be able to figure out what females will be synced up with each other so you can kind of get all one set of growing at one time. You don't have to worry about anything else. So to control your spawning conditions, you want to make sure your temperature is around 85, of course, like they were earlier. These guys are also on the equator, so they want a 12-12 cycle, 12 light, 12 dark. Um, water quality, they also have the same thing as the regular, uh, the rest of the fish, but they also want to make sure that we um, have a good influx of new fresh water. This would kind of stimulate their whole behavior of spawning themselves because nobody wants to spawn in a mud puddle. So our systems themselves are about six feet across and are 18 inches deep. It's a preferable range for them for that. Um, we also provide a bunch of uh, PVC hides and rocks in there and it kind of just stimulates their own development and their own behavior practices where they'll spit out the eggs in a nice confined, confined area and then the female come in to come up and they just seem to like rocks. Um, for the sex ratio, you'll have a one to four ratio. So, and we'll have three sets of each ratio in there. So it'll be three males and 12 females for a total of 15 fish. Um, while they're in these tanks, we'll only feed them a 0.5% of their body weight. And that's more or less to feed the males and the females occasionally. But since the females themselves will start having eggs in their mouth, they will not consume food. So they'll basically starve themselves while they're in the whole process. So when the fish also stop eating, you pretty good chance you already have eggs. And we will check the egg every 10 to 17 days. I try to go around 12 days, just kind of go in, because I don't want to chase around a bunch of free swimming fry from the tanks themselves. So for our design for our systems, we have four. I went again. So we have our little four systems right here. And um, each one of them have their own biofilter, their own heater, and their own air zones and whatnot. So they're all kind of individual circulations. So we also can do four different type of crosses that we want to do, or we can kind of combine them all together and kind of do a mass spawning of every type. Um, and these guys are really only about 315 gallons of water, so it's not a terrible amount of water. Um, from these systems, we will actually start to check for eggs. We will scoop them, usually with a net, and then put them into a five gallon bucket. If you have multiple people, I find it easier if it's just me or one other person, then we'll put them in a hoppas, and then um, that's kind of a, a square PVC thing with a big net underneath. And uh, well, in there, we'll check them for eggs, so you just kind of open their mouth and see what's in there. And then we'll flush out if they have anything. So the collecting of the eggs, you'll have actually the eggs themselves, but also you'll have a, um, they'll swim up fried occasionally if you have way too long for them and you kind of flush them out. From here, you have different stages of development. So from the actual eggs themselves, they'll hatch within three to five days. Then there'll be a sac fry, so they'll have a, uh, I'll use the pointer, but it won't really, it'll take a second. Um, you'll have basically a little fish with a big old yolk sac. Looks super cute on the swimming ground, and they're the ones actually in the bottom of these middle old jars. Um, and they eventually kind of absorb the yolk sac and become a free swimming, swim up larvae and they'll gulp air, fill up the swim bladder, and then at that point, they'll kind of flow out of the top of the uh, McDonald's jars into our buckets, similar to these guys. So the actual McDonald's jars themselves, let's see if I can get this guy right here. So they'll sit there and they'll kind of just tumble around with the water flowing through it. Eventually they'll help swim up and they'll um, suck up the air in the swim bladder and they'll kind of fall out and into these buckets right here. So these little fry buckets are ones I've made. The system itself was actually used for prawn. So we, it was a super deep water, which we didn't really need to do that because the fish actually will go to the bottom and we'll never get them out. So I basically just cut a hole, put um, screen mesh around it, kind of gooped it up, and was able to finally kind of just collect the fish into there. It came out pretty easy and it's pretty easy to feed them all. 
Um, from there, we'll actually move them over to our juvenile system. This is the system we've already previously had. And it has enough of a uh, screen mesh around the center standpipe that you don't have to worry about the fish going down there, especially if they're over about two centimeters, which is when we tend to, tend to move them over. And then we feed them extremely heavy to kind of get them up and running. We want to feed them a very high protein and very high fat content and feed them often. Um, after about, they get about 10 centimeters is when we tend to actually give them out to the farmers for whatever research projects we're doing or whatever people are trying to get donations. Um, so when it comes back to feedings, it's also really important to have good quality feed. We use a commercial starter feed, and so a lot of the actual growing up part is like a 4 to 10 ratio. And we have various sizes themselves, as Jenna will talk about herself. Um, we have these little auto feeders, so they'll actually feed every few hours. But it's really important to not only control how much you feed, but when you feed, but the duration in between. Because these guys are very voracious feeders. They'll keep eating and keep eating and keep eating, and they will push out the food they already ate without actually digesting any of it. So it's really important to kind of keep that going and so you actually get some retention so you aren't wasting much money in the end. So we recommend about every like four, four to five hours in between feedings. And so it's also important to maintain your actual brood stock themselves for multiple generations. For this one, you need to make sure you have actually some kind of genetic inflow so you don't get fish like this guy. Where is it? There we go. This is Kirby. Kirby is a super male also but he is a red one from Miami. He just had a very deformed face. We saw notes him in one of the systems at one point and he became kind of our pet, our little mascot, if you will. And he just, he, he tried to compete with all of the siblings, but they were kind of out competing with all the floating feed and his mouth won't open up big enough for the feed that they were eating. So he kind of just pulled him to the side and grew him up to the side himself. But to not get fish like him, it's really important to actually have genetic diversity, kind of occasionally bringing in outside fish into your strain so you don't actually kind of get your little bottlenecks and problems away. Um, yeah, you just don't want inbreeding. And so, because with that, you don't want to give any of your actual fish away that are inbred to farmers like these guys. We actually recently donated these fish to um, Aiden Fife in uh, Boone, North Carolina. So he is the guy on the left. The one on the right is Jacob, and he actually interned with us in 2016 at some point. And um, he has this lovely little pond out on his little organics farm. And he wanted to be able to put fish in there, just kind of this extra thing. And he was actually using solar power to kind of move some water occasionally out, filter it, put it in some bile shower or another kind of way to settle out some of the organic matter, and then use that to fertilize his pond or his uh, production of plants wise off to the side. And so this is a kind of cute little way of doing it all. Um, and they just wanted a few fish to be able to kind of just see if it worked or not. He was building a little cage to put them inside the pond, and yeah. And so I'll actually get a picture of those hopefully soon, swimming around and growing everything else. And that's about it. So any questions? Um, Jeffrey, so what, I mean, these guys, this is like a pretty advanced, like not advanced, but it's a setup that you know, we have at our aquaculture facility. Can you talk about just, I mean, the reality is like tilapia are super easy to spawn, you know, so maybe if you could just maybe talk for a minute about the, you know, maybe utilizing stuff people have on their farm. Um, and then I was also wondering, um, so what do you feel like the need is for tilapia? You know, we, I know we have a lot of people coming to KSU asking for tilapia. So do you feel like that there is a market here in Kentucky for someone to start a hatchery and for schools or you know farmers or whatever? Yeah, I definitely see like there's a market for it all. These guys are actually super easy to breed. They will breed in a puddle if you give them a chance. They just basically just need a flat bottom. So you can kind of use any kind of system you want. Um, we just happen to use extra tanks that we had, but you can use like an IBC tote or anything kind of just enough of a flat area that they'll be able to spawn spin out the eggs and then actually kind of collect them in their mouth, but they will do it if you give them enough area easily. Um, but yeah, this is kind of an important thing because otherwise you kind of have to go for like Miami and other things, so, um, or outside the country if you get other different strains if you wanted. Um, yeah. People coming in asking like schools and things like that. We get a lot of people coming in. So I mean, just, 
the amount of calls I get for tilapia, I'm like, somebody needs to open a tilapia hatchery in Kentucky. <laughs> you mentioned uh, when the fish go into the larger tanks. How long does the development cycle from when they first are laid to the 10 centimeters that you start using to, to give out? Like, what's the time frame um, in developmental wise um, hatching to small finger? Say so the ones we have in the system right now are, um, are about the tennis meter mark, and they are five months, or sorry, three months old themselves. They were spawned out in February. Um, we probably could have got them up faster to that point because we could have just fed them a bit more intensively, but we were kind of not wanting to push them past that point because after a while they get more of a pain to actually transport. And so we kind of just grew them up to that size and kind of are at more in a holding area right now um, before we actually start getting ready to be donated out. Okay, we have a question from our YouTube audience. They want to know, how many fingerlings does a setup of this size produce annually? Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Uh, you spawn every two weeks, give or take, you can check it. Um, each, each individual female will give you a few hundred eggs, depending. Um, you may have some that will actually throw a bit more or less, depending on what they are. You can get a couple thousand from each tank, and you kind of do that to every two weeks. So you can produce quite a bit if you need to, but you kind of just have to make sure you maintain your brood stock and kind of maybe cycle it in and out. Um, I don't know the t number off the top of my head, but it can be quite a bit. How many times would like a female spawn before you would want to give her a break? Oh, I would probably allow her to spawn three or four times maybe at max, but trying to just kind of judge off how much we're feeding and how aggressive they are with the feeding in between things. I know that the um, males can be pretty hard on the females, like, you know, they corral them and like bump into them. So you, you know, want to maintain their body condition, so. Yeah. Actually, I had a photo of that. So prior with our spawning tanks, there were males actually sparring. I call them the little pink ones on the bottom right. So they actually sit there with their mouth wide open and they will basically aggressively show their mouth and kind of that's how they get their domain, but they actually sit there and kind of nip at each other enough. So yeah, we'll have to make sure that they um, don't beat each other up too much before they, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, Chelsea, do you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right, well, that concludes our presentation portion of Third Thursday for aquaculture. Um, we do offer tours regularly of the facility. We have um, 28 research ponds, a fish hatchery, fish nutrition building, and in 10,000 square foot indoor production facility where we look, do aquaponics and recirculating systems, um, a shrimp greenhouse, and an aquaponics greenhouse, and something else, surely, oh, processing room. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in kind of seeing what some of this looks like in person, we'd love to give you a tour. Um, just contact any of us that have presented here today and we'd be happy to show you around. Um, so we will um, take a break, use the restroom. I think lunch will be ready soon. And then we will get together at one o'clock and go down to the floating raceway. If anybody, you're welcome to walk. It's probably about a 10 minute walk down there, but um, there's also room to drive also. So you can take your vehicle down pretty close. So um, we'll, we'll create a, a vehicle train to go down to the pond um, around one o'clock. Okay, thank you.
There are ponds across Kentucky and across this country that have been built by NRCS for many years. This is one of them. They're a watershed pond with a dam. There is a emergency spillway so that it won't top the dam and it'll go around. They're relatively deep. This one's about 12 feet deep, maybe 14 feet deep. We've never drained it. I thought about draining it and have a clean pond to start with. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I was afraid that if I drained the pond that I'd never get the damn thing filled up again because the drain structure might be damaged or not work exactly right. And so I just chose not to make grief for myself. So what do we have in this pond? It's normal everyday pond with bass and bluegill. It had a weed problem. So we put in grass carp and koi. And for the past, well, I don't know, Years since I've been here, the weed problem has disappeared. I don't know if you remember, there may have been some, uh, about four years ago, they had a demonstration of applying sonar. Sonar is a herbicide that kills all kinds of things. Uh, so we have weeds controlled. We have bass and bluegill. We stocked catfish. We stocked large catfish with the idea of collecting the spawns. And uh, we've stopped doing that now because we're focused more on largemouth bass. But to start, we just put some, some spawning cans in the pond and uh, they laid eggs in the cans. We go rob the nest and we hatch them out and we bring them back here. And the catfish that are in Raceway 1 are fish that were actually spawned here and grown up. And from a, uh, a cost standpoint, that has a certain appeal because if you can produce your fingerlings rather than buying fingerlings, that's kind of nice. And uh, so, that also from a biosecurity standpoint, uh, oh, here we go, we've got more. Uh, you're not bringing in fish that may carry a disease. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, catfish don't bring as much per pound as bass, so we're looking more at bass. We did catfish last year. The device we're using is a floating raceway. And we have two basic designs here. Uh, we have what we bought and we have what we made. And with the small farmer in mind, we wanted to have something that they could make at a relatively modest cost. So, the, the two units we have, this is, it looks kind of uh, junky, okay? That's fine. This one here uh, uh, on the left is, is uh, uh, one of the homemade ones. And the, the bigger ones are, are out there. There's three of them. They're made of a plastic. And as a floating raceway, it's a lot like a cage, but you can put more fish in it. It's a lot like a cage, but you circulate water through it. Unlike a cage, it's, it's a solid sheet of plastic, except at either end where there's a screen. And the idea is to induce flow, and really as much flow as you can, because more flow means you carry waste out and you bring oxygen in. Uh, and so, the basic concept is much like a, a uh, trout raceway. If you've ever been to uh, these where they have a concrete channel and you have spring water or even mine water or some sort of water that is, usually it's for trout, so it's cold enough for trout. And it amounts to a, a, uh, a channel where water flows through it and you have a screen on either end. And all you're doing really is stocking it with fingerlings, feeding fish, and then when they get up to be a harvestable size, harvesting them. So it's not a hatchery. It's something for grow out. And you might even, I like to think of it as an aquatic feedlot. So the principle is just that. These floating raceways, instead of being the channel with gravity flow, we have to have a device that will induce flow. And there are different ways of doing that, and that's what uh, James Brown was working on 
uh, for his master's thesis and uh, he's pretty much finished that up and uh, so we're moving on to the next step. But we had three devices and all the devices are here right now, we're using two of them. The first device is something called an airlift. It's, you hear that sound in the background? That's an air blower. It's a high volume air pump. Now if you have a, a compressor in a shop, that's gonna be high pressure, low volume. This is high volume, low pressure. All we wanna do is push it down far enough in the water and have it go through a diffuser grid that breaks it up into small bubbles and we want those bubbles to rise to the surface, but we contain it so that the bubbles can induce a current going one direction. And we're calling that a grid airlift. There is a crusty old thing over here on the left that's uh, an example of that. You wanna take a quick look? So these, uh, <laughs> this was together like this. Come on. There we go. All right. This, this was together like this, and this was hooked to the air blower. So that blew the air down into this, this frame here, this manifold. And then these are diffuser. They're like soaker hose. But they're a special for, uh, it's, it's got a thicker wall, and it's, it's anyway, it's special for this purpose. I'm not going to go to Lowe's and buy soaker hose. I'm going to buy from, from this company. But uh, that creates a, just like a square of bubbles, and they're rising. And with this cowling here, with this cover, there's only one way it can go, that way. So when we're running this thing in a raceway out there, now some of you heard, heard James's uh, uh, presentation, so you, you're not allowed to answer this question, all right? Those who didn't hear his presentation, how much water in gallons per minute do you think you can push that way? 25. We're looking at more like 3,000 or more gallons per minute. I've always been short. Yeah. It's, it's, we're not lifting the water. We're just pushing it. If we were trying to lift it, it would be completely different. But we're just trying to induce a current and we really only care if that current goes to the end of the raceway. It doesn't have to go further than that, as long as the fish get water circulated through. You'll see in a minute what it looks like. Uh, there's actually sort of an eddy created because the, the bubbles rising, there's a good bit of velocity here at the top, but there's actually kind of a and eddy, because the bubbles aren't, you know, the current's not the same down here. The current's going to be near the top. Where we is, yeah, it's, it's about five feet deep, okay? The, ta the tank, that is, the race itself holds about 11,000 gallons. So it's exchanging, like, what, 10 times, maybe even 15 times. And that's good. I mean, uh, okay, on this side there will be a screen, so the fish can't can't go, and we'll we'll go there. But I, we have enough folks here right now. I want to make a point about uh, logistics and safety. Uh, it's no good if someone falls in the water or hurts themselves. We don't want that to happen. Okay? 
So I would like uh, to maybe, uh, uh, at least maybe break it into two groups and uh, or at least we can distribute and maybe we can cycle through so everyone can, ha can see, but not all crowd around the same place at the same time. Uh, it's most stable, the central dock, the, the dock that goes straight out, the plastic dock. If you start crawling out on these others, it's not as stable. And one person at a time on the others if, if you're going to go out there. And uh, uh, I just want to caution you that the center dock is the most stable. That's the safest place to be. Now, there's plenty of fish uh, in the pond, and I can give you a little bit of feed, and you can throw feed around and see what comes up. Uh, we think we're going to be able to trap quite a few fish out of the pond during the course of the year. So uh, we have the farthest raceway is called Raceway 1. That has an airlift. The next raceway is Raceway 2, and that just has a, an aerator motor with a propeller on it, and it's just pushing water. So you can't see much of what's going on there, but you can see a current. Raceway 1 has channel catfish around 4,000 pounds. Raceway 2 has largemouth bass, about 1,000 pounds of stalker-sized fish that we're going to spread out and grow out this year. We had wished that well, the catfish were harvested and gone already, but we'll get to it here as soon as we can. Raceway 3 is what we're going to use as a trap this year. And we're going to have to take the paddle wheel off. You can see, well, not so well, but there is a paddle wheel there. And the reason we wanted to mess with a paddle wheel was that a, something called a slow rotational paddle wheel should be the most efficient way to move volumes of water. And if we ever wanted to make this an off-the-grid type of device, we're going to have to go with a smaller motor than what is running this. This is being run by a one horsepower air blower. So that's one horsepower 24 hours a day, all summer long, and maybe even all winter long if we keep fishing during the winter. Whereas the paddle wheel is running with a 1 15th horsepower. That's one divided by 1 5. So it would take 15 of those motors to make what's running one of these. And uh, frankly, the, we discovered that the uh, slow rotational paddle wheel that we had made with uh, the benefit of some of the folks at the University of Kentucky Ag Engineering, uh, we have some uh, improvements to it to, to make and to evaluate. But at this time, these, even though they take more energy, they do a wonderful job moving water, but they also aerate, whereas the propeller-driven unit does not. So uh, his, his work was to look at flow and energy uh, use um, and relevance to solar energy. And we had a University of Kentucky uh, individual who did modeling of the uh, solar approach and figuring out how many panels it would take. And I don't have that off the top of my head. If we wanted to do a one horsepower motor with, uh, with panels and batteries for nighttime, you know, to store the energy and run it, it just, it's just too much, okay? It just, it, we can, anyway, for a one horsepower motor to be run by, by solar off the grid, that's, that's a lot. So, uh, now what else is going on in these raceways? You see the two smaller raceways, the homemade ones. We're using them in a different fashion. We simply have a water pump and we have a, a, an end wall that is a piece of plywood with a hole in it. We plumbed water, we plumbed that, that, the output to that pump through it. And then we stocked it with fry. Now the one here on the left has some paddlefish fry in it. And uh, I can try to dip up and uh, see what they look like right now. Uh, we've never done this before. That is, we don't know how many fish are there. We've never tried paddlefish in a, in a, in a pond like this. Uh, and uh, I know there's some in there, or there were some in there earlier, and whether I can find them. They're about a month old. 
Now, I don't know how many of you know about paddlefish. I know all of our aquaculture folks at KSU do, but they can get big. And the biggest fish in the pond right now are paddlefish. Um, earlier this year, we got some brooders out that were around 60 pounds. We have about 50, maybe between 50 and 70 paddlefish loose in the pond that are intended to be grown out for caviar or brood stock or whatever, just for, for large fish. But uh, we thought we'd try some here uh, and, and see how it goes. And the reason is this, just as you have grass on the hillside as a food source for your grazing animals, whether they be cattle or goats or sheep or whatever, the green color, the bloom on this pond is what the fish graze. And so we're just pumping the bloom through and expecting the young fish to see what they can get. We also have, with a paddlefish, a belt feeder on top with a little bit of a supplementary feed. And uh, anyway, this was uh, just something we wanted to try. So it's not a replicated experiment. It's not even funded research, okay? It's just sometimes you can do things you can try things out and then you call it preliminary data, okay? And maybe you then can write a grant or, or maybe you just find something out that was kind of neat. So uh, we know we have a few fish there. The other raceway we stocked earlier today with largemouth bass fry. And we're doing the same kind of thing. Now right now it's not pumped through. We'll get that started the next day or two. but. Uh, the idea is to pump the bloom through and protect the fish from all of the other critters that's going to munch on them. And uh, we have at the end of that at the end of that one there is just a screen with uh, window screening. So we're trying to pump about 100 gallons a minute through for the the larvae to graze. And at some point we'll go in there. It's about 30 days. The plan is to go in there and and see how they've grown. We hope they're about an inch long at that time. Uh, so we're using these then in two ways. One is to produce seed, and one, the other is as a, as a feedlot. So these smaller raceways, these homemade ones, in this moment are oriented towards seed production, meaning fingerlings. Later this year, We'll take feed trained largemouth bass and we'll have three of these units made and we'll have a replicated set of observations and look and see how the, uh, the bass, after they're trained on feed, perform in these systems. Last year's preliminary data showed uh, over 87% 80, uh, recovery. <coughs> Excuse me. I say recovery because they just weren't in the raceway, okay? They could be in the pond. Uh, and then uh, we had about 2% growth per day. So uh, that is 2% body weight per day. So the fish grew from 5 grams to about 50 grams over about 100 days. And so 50 grams is like about a tenth of a pound. So that's, that's what we're up to here. Uh, are there any questions? One, one more thing, uh, yeah. Dr. Simmons is, is a bit modest. He just recently got a, a big, he, okay. he just. We'll just have to repeat what you say because the virtual audience won't be able to hear. Oh, so I, can I'm, I stand close to the microphone? Okay. <laughs> and then you can have virtual audience can hear. Okay, I, I, I was just saying that Dr. Simmons is a bit modest because he just recently got a three year USDA grant to do uh, research with this floating raceway at how, how many hundred? Thousand, like it was, uh, almost six hundred, almost six hundred thousand dollar three year grant from the USDA. So uh, that's just uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, uh, well, shall we go see what we can see? Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, but I need it, Chris. I'm, I'm falling out all, all, all over the place. It's all right. Yeah.
And if you want to... Okay. Slack. All right. Here we go. Okay. So watch your step. Uh, come on out. All right. These are the, These are the uh, paddlefish. And I have no idea if we're going to see any. There, there's one. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what. Can someone just hold this uh, net for a moment? I'm going to go get something to put them in. What? Good? We're doing fine. All right. Tell you what, why don't you grab that? Okay. Fish are stocked so densely. All right, so now you can hand them around and, and look at them. Imagine that fish growing to be over 100 pounds. Oh my God. Are these the ones that we yes. spawned earlier this season? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. They've already gotten that big. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. Yes, I just changed the mesh size to quarter inch mesh. Oh, that is a problem. Paddlefish. So they call it spoonbill catfish. That's like yeah. the, oh, the country. It's, it's not a catfish. It's more like a sturgeon. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know about fish. Okay. Well, it's like, it, makes, it, it makes a black caviar. Oh. The expensive oh. black caviar. Maybe oh, they'd like to see them. Yeah. So how small were those when you stocked them? Um, the size of your fingernail, like probably. At least that's what I, that was the last time I saw them was that size. Lengthwise, they might be about that long. Okay, wow. Yeah. And that, and that, that was it with the end of like a month, month, month time period of growth right there? Yes, gotcha. yes. Wow. Wow. So uh, they're, they're, they're growing rapidly. Yeah. And yeah. How, how long is the lot? Like nobody cut them. Like how long they live? Um, 30 years more. Long time. At what point do they reach their full size out of those 30 years? They mature at about, the females around eight years. Depends on if they have an abundant food supply or not. You know, they can grow slow, they can grow fast, and they can grow when the times are good and slow down when the times aren't. But uh, about eight years for maturity. Uh, and a size uh, for a, a female, maybe around 30 pounds. Okay. Now there's a it's fun here because there are plenty of fish that eat. Okay, so the way this is set up, you can see there's a pump there and you can see a little bit of current. Okay. And that's what's feeding the fish, except for... We put that on there to keep the raccoons from helping themselves. So this is a belt feeder, and you can see the feed. We'll feed it, in, we'll put it in the morning, we'll put feed on it, and it'll just slowly drop feed in it. And so uh, these things are about, it's about four feet deep inside the raceway. And they, they actually prefer not to have the bright sun. So it's, it's, that's one reason it's covered up. I'll leave that open, because others may want to see. Go ahead and just dump them in, yeah to the left of the screen. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So we had some issues with flotation and we've decided to use these IBC totes instead of uh, barrels. Okay. And we're gonna take and put an air blower on top of it and we're gonna have it all contained in a single unit. Okay.
Let's see. So now you can see the air blower running. And it makes a nice current. Keep in mind there's an eddy there, so it's it's kind of like that. That device in the middle is a demand feeder. And the fish learn to knock the rod and it drops feed into the raceway. So uh, right now we're, we're, we're just trying to maintain these, these, these catfish in this raceway. It's about 4,000 pounds in here. Oh, wow. And we're only feeding them, yeah, right here. 4,000 pounds in that. In that raceway. We're, between, last year, in these three raceways, we grew 13,000 pounds of catfish. Uh, but we're, we fill that with a sack of feed on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and by evening it's gone. You can walk out there. So we, we wondered, can the bass do the same thing? And they're learning to do it. So there are, there are bass in this one here on the right. And uh, here, if you sit tight, I'm gonna walk around you. There he goes, he just fed himself. About five feet. So there, we stocked about a thousand pounds of bass in here. So this one's the air bubble flow through three thousand pounds. This is just the propeller. But you see the current. And when he was measuring flow, he'd measure it at the end there. It's got a nice cross-section and we're measuring velocity and then the the cross-sectional area in order to get uh, volume this one does 3,000 gallons per minute. this one will do the same oh, really? yeah the thing is there's no aeration on this side and that can really be a lifesaver but it caught this is running on a three-quarter horsepower motor and that's one horse so if you're looking at energy you don't have to have aeration all the time you can have aeration just when you need it. And in the end, we're going to have it where the, there's a sensor up there that measures oxygen and an aerator here that'll be turned on when it's needed. And we, we think that will help with uh, energy costs. But uh, it's always fun to feed the fish. Now, I had a pond I don't have anymore, and uh, had catfish in it and some other stuff. And I told my city friends that I would take my fish for a walk every evening. And like most people, they don't believe all of what I say. Right? <laughs> so I took the feed out there, and we'd pitch a little bit, walk a little bit, pitch a little bit, walk a little bit. And I said, "See, they follow me right along." They follow you right along. Yeah. My fish follow me. All right. They Let's had never see. seen fish feeding in a pond, so just that fact alone. Yeah. Just... Well, these are the fish that are in the raceway. Now I'm going to go feed the fish that are outside the raceway. Here. You want to feed the fish? Not especially, sir. R r right here. You want to try? <laughs> Go ahead, take the whole thing. And just throw it in one handful at a time. See what happens. Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. What do you all use? Uh, and are there any fish in the lower pond? Down there? Yes, sir. Uh, we don't have anything to do with that. I'm sure there are fish there. But I have never been down to that pond. Oh, my. What do they use it for? I have no idea. Now... 
You know, now that yeah. that pond was designed by me. Wasn't and it? the one up there at UK for the animal waste situation. Really? Yes. Dr. Higgins was a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And they told us to build that pond and design it and build it uh -huh. because they needed for research because they couldn't, they didn't have enough water to do research on their vegetable crops. Well, and now that's why we designed it. Well, I, <laughs> I would like very much. Okay, I have, an, I have an idea how to use that. I mean, we have to conserve our water. We would like to take the waste from these fish and irrigate and have some yes. crop cropland but and, and but we 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 would lose water in our 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 and if 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 we can if if we can just conserve water by maybe pumping it back up anyway so i don't run the university yeah but knowing the design of that pond and the capacity of it, which is much yeah. greater than this. Really? Oh gosh, yes. Gee, I'd be, yeah. be doing this down there then. Well, it's a big pond, it's deep. That, the pond right below this one? Yeah, I designed that pond, okay. sir. Okay. I designed it, and the state furnished the money. Okay. And I inspect both ponds every year and make suggestions on the upkeep of them. That's my ah. job, I work for the USDA. Okay. Yes, I'm an okay. engineer for the USDA. Tell me your name, sir. Bill Thomas. Bill Thomas. You Ken, know Ken, Ken Simon? Simmons. Yes, of course. That's a very good friend of mine. Marvelous. I don't like that old uh, poison hemlock. I'm scared of it. It stinks, and I don't think it's good. <laughs> if I were you, I'd take that away. <laughs> I'd be happy to have that gone. Yeah, yeah, I'd be yeah. happy to have this iris gone yeah, too. Yeah. But the poison hemlock, it's it's nasty. Yeah. Yes, well, yes, we, they've gotten rid of most of the willows, which, which, especially yes, the ones yes. on the dams. Yes, yes, that's what we recommend. Yeah. Keep those because it'll make the pond leak. Right. But the USDA, the president of this university, mm -hmm. and the head of here. our agency Keep going. here in Kentucky, have an effort to design that pond. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. I need to look closer at that sucker. Yeah. It's it's a big pond and yeah. it's very deep. I've got the designs for it in my office. See, we had to, we had to. Uh, that's a destratifier. It yeah, looks I like understand. an aerator, but it actually goes down deeper. Yeah. So it's, and we had to do that. We noticed that we ha this pond has stratification, and and we had to stop that. I understand. So yes, yes. that's that's been good. But this 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 stuff also induces a current that yeah. helps to mix the pond. Yes. I uh, did a survey from that upper pond up there where the spring comes out mm -hmm. all the way down through here and we studied this for about two years before I designed that pond. Okay. We studied it. Well, I, I would like to pay more attention to that. I'm well, afraid I haven't done our, anything that way. <laughs> well, we did the design so, for that and mm -hmm. uh, supervised construction mm -hmm. and the state of Kentucky uh, furnished the money for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a pleasure working with KSU doing that. And of course, this is my yeah. alma mater also. There you go. Yes. <laughs> and well, your, your presentation was wonderful. I really good. enjoyed it. Well, we, we think that these smaller raceways can be built for around $2,500, including the air blower. Whereas just, just without any docks or anything, this, this costs $5,000 just for the raceway. And, uh, See, I'm an old man, so I'm scared to go out there. I might fall in. There. <laughs> <laughs> you have to fish me out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but everything is like good. Wonderful. I have good. certainly gained and enjoyed the presentation so today. I'm glad. Yes, indeed. It is a pleasure to meet you. Yes, sir. Likewise. Likewise. Yes, sir. I've been in sales marketing. All right. So, uh, it's a beautiful day. Yes, sir, it is. Indeed. Yes, and thank you very much for filling me in on the information. You're welcome. Yes, Likewise. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So well, it looks like uh, everyone's just sort of uh, exploring things, uh, feeding fish, uh, and uh, socializing. Uh, it's a beautiful day here today, but I guess we're, we're about done. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, if you have any questions, I hope that I hear from you. Thank you.